The position of men with regard to fatherhood is made clear with the title of this show. Regular pictures of fathers protesting about their rights to see their children. In this country, married or not, a father has no automatic legal rights to access. On the one hand, fathers are seen as a vitally important pillar of family when he's together with the mother. But as soon as they split up, a transformation takes place, which turns the man into a completely unnecessary and even dangerous presence. The mother is, for whatever reason, doesn't want the father to see his children. Now, I can understand the father who wants to see his children would be extremely aggrieved if the court um, says that he doesn't think contact is, is, is appropriate in that situation. Um, there may, be, however, be very good reasons why the court considers it not in the child's best interest for the father to have contact. Uh, there also may be very good reasons why they might order that contact to be supervised contact. Why haven't you seen him? Well, I tried it first, but Maggie made it very difficult. I'd only had these supervised visits with a social worker that had watched me. It was like I was a criminal. You know. Children have been exposed to dangerous fathers far too frequently where the courts actually should reject contact. Women's Aid was sat there for one reason and one reason only, and that was to make sure that after divorce or separation, wherever humanly possible, those fathers did not see their children again. That was their single overriding objective. On divorce or separation, he's typically removed from even seeing his children and labelled a criminal stalker if he tries to see them against the mother's will. His only remaining purpose in the eyes of the law is to make monthly cash payments to the mother. One father lived just one street away from the mother and he saw the mother walking down the street with his little girl and so she ran to him saying, Daddy, 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 and the mother literally pulled the child away from her father in the middle of the street because it's like it's not your contact time. Basically, a mother's whim is a sole deciding factor as to the importance of a father in a child's life. Your wife still insists that following the divorce they live solely with her. Until then, they can continue to spend one night a week at your apartment. Well, why can't they after our divorce? Your wife maintains that long term that would be disruptive. What? A judge may sympathise. You would, of course, have visiting rights. No, 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 that's not good enough. Proper access, OK? Yeah, I want to be a father to my children, not just, you know, the bloke who takes them to McDonald's once a month. I spoke to a lawyer about men's parental rights. What rights do unmarried fathers automatically have? Automatically, they don't have any right automatically, but they have an automatic right to apply for rights. They have a standing. I think it's really important to remember when people say unmarried fathers have no rights or there's a lack of rights and that unmarried fathers need rights. We need to think about who are these unmarried fathers and it can be all sorts of situations. Somewhere we're going to be very sympathetic towards them having rights and other scenarios where actually the thought of giving an unmarried father an automatic right, an automatic right would be quite inappropriate. There's some stranger rapist or some uh, anonymous um, one-night stand. It doesn't really tell us much about the nature of those people, their ability to parent or their suitability to parent. If a woman decides to have a baby after sex with a man that she barely knows, where he might not even know he's a father, I'd say the woman's suitability to parent is far more at issue than the man's. Carol was hoping you might help her find out who its father is. <laughs> <laughs> All she knows is that it happened at New Year's Eve at your party. At the fancy dress? At about 10 o'clock. But yeah, there should be a process put in place by which father gets automatic parental responsibility. The mother, after all, gets automatic parental responsibility whether she is a terrible mother or not. Um, it's, there, there's no qualification for becoming a mother or a father. Um, you can't have a mother automatically becoming a mother with no test, with, with, with no discretion, and then say the father must prove himself. That's, that's ridiculous. But many women would say that the test was a nine-month pregnancy. Um, a nine-month pregnancy does not test your ability to bring up a child. It doesn't test your patience. You doesn't, there's an enormous amount of, of, of infanticide that, that the mother actually commits. Um, the way I was brought up, all the, all the, all the physical punishment came from the mother. There is, there is this kind of fairy tale attitude of, of the woman being very soft and loving and, and naturally motherly, which I think women would resent. Um, and it's, it's not true. There is, a, you know, carrying a, a baby to term does not, a, does not make you a nice person. <laughs> carrying a baby to term does not make you a caring, kind, and soft person. It just makes you a person who's carried a baby to term. 
But even if we ignore irresponsible mothers, the law's treatment of fathers doesn't make sense. One of the automatic rights they have is the right to support their child. That's often seen as a responsibility rather than a right, but the difference between right and responsibility isn't that clear-cut sometimes. Well, it seems really clear-cut when it comes to fathers. Sex with a woman that leads to a baby is either significant or it's not. It confers rights and responsibilities on the father, or it confers neither. One cannot say that having sex is such a serious undertaking that it can automatically lead to 18 years of financial responsibility for a man, yet at the same time it's so unimportant that the man should have no automatic parental rights. How can this be happening to men in what is so often described as a male-dominated society? That's disjuncture between financially supporting a child but not actually um, necessarily having the right over that child isn't necessarily a conflict if you think, well, the purpose of law is to protect the welfare of the child. I think there's something a bit unpleasant about the idea that if, because I'm paying for the child, therefore I have the right to see the child. It rather reduces a child to some sort of um, a hired purchase car agreement or something, where it's an object somehow. And it's, you know, one of the famous judges in this area, um, Justice Sloss, Butler Sloss, said, you know, a child is a subject, not the object of concern. If you, you need to think about what's in the child's best interest before the father. And again, it comes back to the distinction between fathering as an activity and fathering as a status. If you have the status of a father, um, you should pay for the child. That's your duty to pay for the child. It's not fair that, that women have complete power over whether a father, or whether a man becomes a father. Um, and that's the bottom line. A woman has control over whether a man becomes a father. It's not fair, but it's, it's, it's the way of the world. So what you do is you try and protect the father as much as possible. You try and give him as much as many rights as possible. Um, at the, but right now, what we seem to be doing is simply punishing a man who doesn't want to become a father, who a woman has made a father. And that doesn't seem right to me, that you punish him. He should be protected, not punished. The mother tries, remarries and tries to have her children's surname changed to her new married name so that she wants her new nuclear family, her, the stepfather and her children, all having the same surname of the stepfather, her new husband. It's relatively easy for a mother to change their child's surname and as little a father can do in this situation, it's futile to turn to the law as the law clearly does not protect men as our first woman law lord, Dame Brenda Hale, made very clear recently. She said uh, it was a very poor kind of parent um, who would insist upon calling the child by its own name. So not only had this man lost his last viable connection with his child in this particular case, but he had been told he was a bad dad for trying to keep any sort of relationship going. How devastating. It's a way of, uh, of, of excluding the father. And what does the father think? Why did the mother do it? It was for reasons to do with her, not, not to do with the child. And to, and to say that he was a bad father because he objected, I mean, I, I'm sorry, with every respect to a very senior judge, this judge doesn't agree. I salute the men of Fathers for Justice who have highlighted the terrible treatment of fathers and children at the hands of mothers and the state. The media has sought to viciously attack the movement and attempts to paint the picture of a league of abusive dads. I think the bottom line here, uh, it's quite interesting the Home Secretary raised it, he said we're protecting our way of life and this Labour administration protecting our way of life has resulted in 300,000 children losing partial As I say, or total we're not here to, develop, to talk about the face with two men dressed up in stupid outfits. But it's two separate issues here, Kirsty. Yeah. The, the, the issue, the issue, no, no, I think, I think what we're Am talking about here is security. Am I doing an interview here, here or are you talk to, just straight through me, Kirsty? I'm going to ask you questions well, which are relevant them? to a discussion, and, and there could actually have been shots fired today. Isn't that a very dangerous situation? I think it's dangerous, and I think you, want, you have to ask yourself, why are dads doing this? And that's the question you've got to... Several aspects of father's rights literally amaze me. The fact that mothers would want to have a child with a man and then deny him access because he's unsuitable amazes me. If he's unsuitable, why have the child with him in the first place? The fact that courts can order that fathers have access and the mothers can ignore this with impunity amazes me. But what amazes me most about the whole issue is that this has been going on for decades. 
How have these men near silently withstood their treatment at the hands of the mothers, the police, social services and the family courts? But I would not dress up as Batman, but I could fully understand why these people do it, because we don't... Uh, we don't know what's gone on in their lives as well. I, for one, would go crazy under the treatment doled out to thousands of fathers on a daily basis in this country. I try to imagine not being able to see my little boy every day, but I find the thought utterly intolerable. 